Welcome to the second installment of my world breaking series where we look at the elements of D&D that DMs sometimes ban from their games. The point of the series is to give you some guidance on whether or not you want these aspects in your game or not. Today I want to talk about classes. From what we can tell online, it does not seem very common for 5th edition DMs to ban full classes from their games. Subclasses are very common, and we'll talk about that next time. But there are a few exceptions. First, let's start with homebrew and third-party products. There are a lot of DMs who do not allow these in their games. This goes for everything from homebrew classes people put up on Reddit to professionally written, fully play-tested classes put out by companies like MCDM, like the Illrigger, the Knight of Hell, or the Beast Heart, the Monster Tamer class. And the reason why these tend to be banned is simple. We don't know whether or not the balance will match the core game. Balance is a very tricky thing to discuss in 5th edition, because it's very easy for someone to say that something is unbalanced, but for others to not agree or not have the same experience. By the very nature of D&D, we are all experiencing the game very differently. Matt Colville has a great video about other examples of this phenomenon, if you're curious. But I do genuinely sympathize with DMs who don't want to allow classes or subclasses that weren't officially published by Wizards of the Coast into their games. After all, if you take a monster from homebrew or a third-party source and put it in your game, it'll probably only show up for one, maybe two sessions. But if somebody plays a class from another source, that class will be in every session of the game that that player is a part of. And if it seems unbalanced, which is not necessarily the same thing as it actually being unbalanced, then everyone will think about it during every session. Even when some mechanic is utterly benign and has no real impact on the game, just mentioning any mechanic from the class by name could send shivers down the spine of the players or the DMs if they are overall having a tough experience understanding the class or reconciling it or making it work within the game. Because they're trying to get used to the system, they're not having a great experience with this class, any benign element of it that's mentioned will remind people of the bad experience they're having. I sympathize because that's basically the experience that I had when one of my players played a mystic from the Unearthed Arcana, which for those who are not familiar, Unearthed Arcana is Wizards of the Coast's playtest program. And man, I really disliked my experience running a game for the mystic, and partially it's because it felt too powerful. Even if some of the class traits were actually fine because they replicate what the other classes do at similar levels, it didn't feel that way. It seemed overpowered because we didn't have a clear frame of reference for how it lined up with the other classes. It existed in its own category at the table, and that made it really difficult to judge fairly. Like, my feelings about the Mystic notwithstanding, I do think that just the experience of having it at the table was unpleasant because we didn't have any context for it. We couldn't really categorize it compared to the other classes in a fair way. Now, it can be tempting to lump Unearthed Arcana in with discussions of homebrew or third-party products, but I think that's a mistake for a few reasons. First, the fact that Unearthed Arcana is produced by Wizards of the Coast, the company that creates the current version of Dungeons & Dragons, gives it a sense of legitimacy. Even if they put something out that is really just bad, it gets compared to the other Wizards of the Coast products, which is as it should be. But that brings me to the second reason why Unearth Arcana should not be lumped in with homebrew or third-party stuff. Because, usually it happens the other way around. Any third-party material for D&D is usually treated the same way that Unearth Arcana is. And by that I mean, it is often treated with a great deal of skepticism. And the idea that third-party products are not properly balanced is such a pervasive idea in the hobby that a lot of people probably did not even blink when I compared homebrew classes to published third-party classes, when those things are not the same at all. But they do fall into a category that I think anything that's not officially put out by Wizards of the Coast falls into, the made-by-other-people category. Yes, third-party companies do test their products a lot, but because they don't make the core game, we don't actually know if their approach to the game is the same as the folks at Wizards of the Coast. In fact, we can probably guess that it isn't, because they're making a product that the folks at Wizards aren't making because they feel that there is an absence, there's a gap. There's a need in the game that they feel is not being filled, so they created something that would satisfy that. Which is totally fine if you know what you're getting into and you know the expectations 
that these other creators have about the game. And that difference of the approach it takes to 5th edition can present itself in ways you might not be expecting. Still, while I can totally understand any reluctance to include a third-party product in your game, I personally would give anything a try at least once. The challenge, of course, can be that a player could get very used to mechanics that you feel, or other players feel, don't work at the table. For any number of reasons, including, but not limited to, the class being totally busted. And then the worry is that when you ask the player to work with you so you can make a small change and make the class fit a little bit better at the table, you're going to find out that the mechanic you have a problem with is maybe their favorite part. So this is why I personally would be very, very clear with any player bringing anything that's not official Wizards of the Coast material to a game, in advance of the first session, I would say, we are going to keep an eye on this. We might need to make adjustments as the game goes along, because we might discover that the people making this material have a very different mindset from mine when it comes to 5th edition. That's not a bad thing, by any means. Specificity can make game design really, really successful, as long as you're on the same page as the original creators. And I don't necessarily know that yet. I'm not gonna necessarily have that answer until we play with the class a few times. And actually, I use this approach for Unearthed Arcana as well. So this is the first category of classes that get banned, which is to say, material that is not officially published in a Wizards of the Coast book. And now you know how I would handle that without outright banning it, but still regarding it with the skepticism that I think is fair when anything is interfacing with the core game in a way that you're not sure yet how it's going to work. Hopefully that makes sense. But there are a couple of officially published in an official hardback book, Wizards of the Coast classes that get banned sometimes as well. The most common of these, and the one that kind of exists in a category of its own, is the Artificer. Because the Artificer is a magical inventor. And for a lot of players, and especially a lot of DMs, that feels out of genre. Artificers make perfect sense in the Eberron campaign setting, which is where they originated. In the world where there are magic trains everywhere, having a class that can build robots or guns makes perfect sense. But part of your job as a DM is to cultivate a consistent tone at the table. And in the same way that you don't want someone rolling into your epic fantasy game with a character named Holden McGroin, you might also feel that your gritty fantasy game will be disrupted by having a character who can, you know, build a robot. This personally is not an issue that I have when running my games, but again, I sympathize. But I think part of the reason it doesn't bother me is because I watched Campaign 1 of Critical Role. And yes, there was an Artificer character on the show for a brief time, but that's actually not what did it for me. Instead, I look at how Matt Mercer and Talis and Jaffe explored the concept of Percy, the Gunslinger. They had to adapt the Gunslinger from Pathfinder rules, so their version is a fighter subclass. Unlike the Artificer, Percy did not use magic to create his gun. Well, there was maybe some inspiration at play, but not consciously. He, it was a regular gun. I mean, actually, it wasn't. His first gun was enchanted, so it could do magical damage, but it wasn't enchanted to do gun things. It was a functional gun. Well, functional, there was a chance of misfire. You, you get what I mean. He built a regular gun. And guns are something that a lot of DMs and players struggle to visualize in the traditional classic fantasy land that most D&D games take place in. But what Matt and Taliesin always kept on the forefront of their minds when dealing with this issue was the concept that Percy was the inventor of the gun. This wasn't a world where guns existed. This was a world where one man had just invented the gun. Now, that's still something that's going to have a huge ripple effect on a campaign world. We've seen that as the folks at Critical Role have played more games in the same setting, and the technology has continued to proliferate. But this would be my approach to the Artificer if I was running a game in a traditional, classic fantasy world along the lines of Forgotten Realms or Greyhawk. Now, if you're running in a game that is deliberately very low magic, something that's more like Conan the Barbarian, then yeah, there's really no way to reconcile the Artificer with that. But if you're going that far, then you've probably already cut some of the core classes anyway. So let's talk about the final reason classes get cut. To go off campus and get food. Nope, sorry. Wrong kind of cutting class. Why do people cut classes out of the player's handbook? Why cut one of the original 12? Well, original for 5th edition. Well, in almost every case, this is not true for everyone, but this is a, the general vibe I've seen. 
they don't have a problem with the rules or the mechanics of the class itself. Instead, the class just does not fit into their idea of their homebrew world. You might want to run a game where there are no gods. So, of course, you want to cut out the cleric and the paladin. While I could point out that the rules don't actually require the cleric or the paladin to worship a god, I also get the instinct of removing them. Because honestly, whenever you create a world where something doesn't exist, the players always want to be the exception. I've played in or run games where this happens. I ran a game once where I said, listen, this doesn't normally happen in my games, but everyone needs to be human for this campaign to work. And multiple players came up to me independently and said, okay, instead of being human, could I? So I could totally imagine saying there are no gods and having a player come up to me and say, okay, but my character thinks there are gods and they may not be correct, but they believe it. They don't know if the god is real or not, that's your call, they might be getting magic from something else. But they're the one individual who still believes that the gods are real. And if they're asking to play, say, a cleric, then at the table, they're still going to have all the powers, they're going to be worshipping to a god, they're going to be the most common example of someone interfacing with the idea that the gods aren't real, and they'll be doing it by worshipping a god. So, functionally, it will feel very much like there are still gods in your world. Honestly, that's as good a reason as any just to cut the class, because that's the only way you're going to get your world building across. Alternately, your campaign world might be low magic overall, and you want to cut classes like the wizard or the sorcerer that are constantly slinging spells as their main mechanic. This ultimately is your choice. Sometimes it can be really hard to get your players on board with your mental image of your world and the tone of your campaign. And the best way to get around that might just be to make some of those decisions on their behalf. But D&D is a game that you play with your friends. And there are times when you might need to make some concessions or some compromises. Sometimes a player has an idea for a character that could work really well in the story of your campaign but it involves using something that you banned because of the lore of your overall world. For example, when I said all humans and two players said, but what about not human? The character concepts themselves were great. They would fit the campaign extremely well. And fortunately, I had anticipated that that might happen. They happened to pick two races that they wanted to play, two ancestries, that I knew exactly how I could still integrate into the campaign. So I had solutions that I could present to make their concept work. In that example, I actually said, your characters believe they are human. They just don't know that they have this hidden ancestry. And we discussed how slowly or when in the campaign that information might be presented. I didn't tell them exactly what I had in mind, but we talked about a few different ways that this secret could be revealed. Similarly, one of your players may want to roll up a character with a class that you have banned for any number of reasons. And when you ask them if they're willing to play something else, they dig their heels in. This is the character that I want to play. Ultimately, at that point, it's your call, but I would just go ahead and let them play it, personally. Again, you may have to ask them to be open to changes that have to be made further down the road. But if they're your friend and you want to play D&D with them, I ultimately think that's more important than any of the rest of it. And if you do decide to allow them to play a class you were not expecting to include, you may be struggling to figure out how to introduce or describe that character in a way that matches your sensibilities or the tone of your world. And for that, you should check out today's sponsor, Describe. Describe has more than 7,000 scenes of professionally written descriptive text to help you and your players represent your spells, monsters, locations, magic items, and NPCs. Or, heck, your player characters. You can submit a character request and get an evocative description of your character that you can take with you to the table. There are some descriptions of specific blood hunters and ill rigger characters that do a really nice job of conveying what is cool about those characters and those classes. You can visit describe.com slash supergeek and use the code supergeek at checkout to save 10% off of your first subscription payment. Thank you so much to Describe for sponsoring this video. And thank you so much for watching. This is a video that takes a while, the World Breaker videos take a while to get all my thoughts straight, and hopefully this helps you think about the classes and characters in interesting ways. I think also this is a video that was a lot easier to make once I had put out the core fantasy video. If you didn't see that one, check it out here. It elucidates a lot of what I was getting at at parts of this video. If you want to support the channel, there are a few ways to do that. 
You can subscribe and ring the bell. That lets YouTube know that you want to see more videos like this. You can join my Patreon and pledge money to help me make this channel as good as it can be. You can join my Discord and be a part of a cool community of people who are interested in D&D or actual play or just like the channel and want to hang out. And you can sign up for my newsletter and get updates about what I've got going on. The links for all those are in the doobly-doo below. Thank you again for watching, and until next time, play fair and have fun.